Okay, so we're recording now. So uh, I'm in the southwest of Scotland right now, which is where this Wild Goose Festival is taking place and the geese have thankfully they've turned up. So that's quite helpful. Um, we've got visitors here from all over the world. If you, if you wanna say where you're from in the chat line, that would be absolutely great just to see where everybody's from. And uh, we've, I happen to notice names coming in from all over the UK, from Ireland, from Norway, from Iceland, the Netherlands, Belgium, um, USA, Canada, and Australia. So it really is an international crowd that we've got today. And to our Swedish friends, there's two Swedish uh, speakers here on, on the program. Hi, hi. Jag heter Lisan. Välkommen. Och god morgon. God formidag. Det var trevligt at trafas. That was probably horrific pronunciation. <laughs> but, so that you know what I was actually saying. Uh, hi, my name is Lisanne. Uh, welcome and good morning. Uh, nice to meet you. This event has been organized by me, Lisanne Henderson. I'm a senior lecturer in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies at the University of Glasgow's campus in Dumfries. In some ways, today's event is a continuation of the conference that I ran um, last year called Scotland in the Arctic. Uh, and this year it was inspired by my participation with the Wild Goose Festival. And I'd like to thank my fellow members uh, of the steering committee uh, for the fun that we've had really um, in putting together this festival, uh, especially the, the Stove Network, uh, the WWT Kerlaverick, and about 12,000 barnacle geese as well, uh, who have uh, started to arrive here in Scotland from Svalbard. This event is also shared with the Orkney Storytelling Festival, which will begin later this month. Which um, So my thanks are going out to Tom Muir and his gang in Orkney for making that happen. So just a couple of general housekeeping uh, messages. Please remember to mute your microphone. I'll come in. And that's why we should, we should uh, mute our microphones. Uh, just because it's disruptive to the speakers and, and whatnot. Consid you can consider, this is, not op this is optional, uh, you can consider turning your video off as well because that would help with, um, if you're having any interference issues, try turning off your, your video and it might help. Um, I also need to remind you, as I did already, that this event is being uh, recorded and it will be made available later on on the Stoves Network um, on, their, uh, on their website and on YouTube. Normally at conferences, I'd be telling you where the emergency exits are and where to find the toilets, but I trust you'll be able to find all that out for yourself. That is one of the advantages, clearly, of having an online event. And if you have any questions, I would ask, this is, this is a continuously running program. Just remember to turn off your, your microphones, folks. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the, in the chat box and we will address your questions at the end. Uh, we'll have about 15 or 20 minutes or so at the end for, for questions. Could you turn off your, uh, your microphone, please? There's a lot of interference. So there are, there are, um, there are uh, many mythical and magical animals in uh, Scotland. Probably the most famous is uh, the Loch Ness Monster, which I'm sure everybody's heard of, first recorded in the sixth century uh, when St. Columba allegedly confronted the beast in, in the River Ness, driving it away into the loch, uh, where apparently it still lives and people still see it. And yet Scotland's official national animal uh, has its origins in the classical world, uh, the unicorn. Uh, the very first descriptions of the unicorn uh, found in the 4th century BC uh, writings of, of Tessius. And the classical authors uh, treated the unicorn as a real animal living in some remote part of the natural world. Um, the unicorn gets absor absorbed into Jewish and early Christian tradition as a symbol of Christ. And by the medieval period, when the unicorn first becomes prominent in Scotland, it has taken on meaning within the context of religious allegory and the literature of courtly love, as well as a popular heraldic device. 
For some beautiful examples, I would encourage you to visit, if you're in Scotland, go to Stirling Castle to see the tapestries, which are heavily feature unicorns. There uh, was also a 15th century Scottish coin produced during the reign of James III called a unicorn because it depicted one with its leg on top of a shield. And James VI also used the unicorn symbolism, uh, which is why after the union of the crowns in 1603, uh, when James becomes King of England as well as of Scotland, the Scottish unicorn was joined with the English lion on the royal arms. The horn of the unicorn was believed to have special curative powers and uh, um, Mary Queen of Scots actually kept a piece of unicorn tusk um, in order to pr protect herself from being poisoned. To get hold of a unicorn's horn was therefore much sought after and the, the animal that is most frequently um, thought to provide or was thought to provide evidence of its, of its existence uh, was actually a small whale uh, from the north, the narwhal. And with the widening of trade routes from medieval times onwards and the expansion of whale hunting um, from the, about the 16th and 17th centuries, the tusk of the narwhal, which, which is actually a, a tooth, became a, a prized luxury item. The first attempts to scientifically demonstrate that narwhal ivory was not in fact from a unicorn uh, was in Denmark by Caspar uh, Bartolin who proved it came from a fish, as he called it, from the Northern Ocean. And it took many people a lot longer to um, accept this, not really until the 18th century, as people must have wanted unicorns to be real. I mean, who wouldn't? I would like them to be real. And the narwhal, it's a small Arctic whale, also known as a sea unicorn, is uh, known to the Inuit of Canada and Greenland as um, Kilalukak uh, Tuagalak, and it has hunted for its whale blubber and also for its tooth, uh, which by the way, only the male narwhal has. Its purpose is still not known. Um, there's lots of theories, but it's still um, unclear. The Inuit have mythological stories about the narwhal, uh, such as this one about a woman who was escaping from an abusive husband when she fell into the water and sunk far below into the ocean. And when she re-emerged, she had transformed into a narwhal. Her hair twisted around and around, creating the corkscrew tusk. When the Scottish explorers and whalers went to the Arctic in the 19th century, they brought back narwhal tusks, uh, traded uh, from the Inuit or caught by the whalers. Mm. And I think I've got a picture here, do I? Oh no, I don't, Never mind. I thought I'd put a picture there of one for you, but I have I've obviously forgotten to do so. And uh, Marshall College Museum in Aberdeen um, has in its possession a narwhal tusk, about 10 feet long. So just to give you an idea how long these things can be, uh, brought back from the Davis Strait. And, uh, oh, it is there. It's just uh, all you guys are, are blocking the picture. I couldn't see it. There it is on the right-hand side of the PowerPoint there. Uh, made around 1800 came from a tusk that was brought back uh, to Scotland by a whaler from Leith. Now, our first speaker, I shall stop sharing. I can figure out how to get out of this now. Have I stopped sharing yet? I think so. You're still sharing, Lausanne. Am I still sharing? How yeah, you, you hit end share, um, a third from the left on the bottom. Third from the left. Is that it now? Am I st have I stopped sharing now? No, you're yeah. still sharing. Yeah. Okay, how do I get out of this? Oh, I'm getting this share. <laughs> I'm not getting how to get out of share. Is there a bar at the top? Yeah. There should be a bar at the top of the screen you're sharing. Mm -hmm. There is something share, but I can't see. It. Oh yeah, here we go. Stop it was hidden underneath something, right? That should be it now, I think. Yes, that's it now. Okay, sorry, folks. I'm not used to. <laughs> I'm not used to Zoom in this way. So our first speaker is Paula Williams. Uh, she's a curator at the National Library of Scotland, and she's going to take us further into the depths of 
the ocean in search of animals, both real and imagined on historical maps. So welcome, Paula. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm speaking. Have you, have you got my screen? Yep. Yep, fab. <laughs> Most important bit. Um, I'm speaking to you this morning from the middle of the central belt of Scotland um, on a very wet morning. So some days it's quite nice not to have to travel to conference. Um, and it's lovely to see so many people joining us today. I'm Paula Williams and I'm curator of the MAPS Mountaineering and Polar Collections at the National Library of Scotland. And thank you to Lausanne for inviting me to speak this morning. The National Library of Scotland has the largest map collection in Scotland and one of the largest in the world. We have more than two million maps and atlases covering Scotland and indeed the whole world. So when Lausanne asked if I could look for um, North Atlantic animals, creatures in our collections, I was delighted to go off and have a rummage. As a curator, we don't often get much time to actually look at the maps. So this was a good opportunity. I think when we think about animal of any sort, most of us who um, enjoy going out searching for animals um, are familiar with field guides. And you're probably quite aware of these kinds of distribution maps that show you where different animals are found. In this case, we're looking at the Atlantic cod and you can see the different regions that it's known to be in and some that are certain and not certain. And even today, it can be quite difficult to pin down the exact distribution of an individual creature's range and particularly as those ranges are changing. But what happens if we look back in time? Here we are back in 1539, almost 500 years ago with this rather fantastic Carta Marina done by Olaus Magnus. He was a Swedish diplomat um, based in Rome and he put together this map from existing maps of the region from Ptolemy's Geographia, which was compiled from a list of latitudes and longitudes of individual places. His own observations and the stories that he'd heard from sailors, probably on his journeys down to Rome. And you can see that some of the creatures are quite, well, I hesitate to use the word realistic, but <laughs> nearly realistic. And then that you can see that the influence of the oral tradition um, towards the top right underneath one of the, um, the rumb lines, you can see the little men inside the whale giant sea serpents crushing ships um, and generally very scary, very large animals come to us through the oral tradition. You can see a few more in a little bit of detail here. The Ursu Albi, the white bear, polar bears on their ice flows, reindeer being harnessed for sledges, eagles catching arctic foxes, something that approaching maybe a heron catching eels, and then a dragon. And I love this mixture between reality and mythical beasts, where actual observation translates into oral tradition and storytelling. Now, some of those animals are brought forward into this map of Iceland by Abraham Ortelius, which was published in the 1570s you can make out the sea animals around the bottom. And some of these are very similar to those on the Carta Marina. There are only two known copies of the Carta Marina today, one in Munich and one in Uppsala. But Ortelius, who was based in Antwerp, must have had access to see one, not just to see it, but to copy it. Some of the animals are exactly like those on the Carta Marina. So something like the polar bears here shown um, round the northeast tip of Iceland, again on their little ice flows, the walruses, the sea cows looking very like actual cows, and the narwhal. And you can see from A, the narwhal, that these illustrations were drawn from um, verbal descriptions, whether written or oral. You can imagine somebody saying, oh, it's this kind of whale thing with a long pointy beak, nose, and somebody has drawn it with a long pointy nose rather than with the horn that we would imagine today. 
and he has other whales. So D, the hyena, is very similar to the host. In fact, it's almost identical drawing, which is why we think that Ortelius must have seen the Cartamarna to be able to use those illustrations to um, illustrate his own. The Xiphius, again, this appeared on the Cartamarna. The English whale, F, down at the bottom, is quite interesting in that it's described on Artelius's map as being, um, or the accompanying text, as being um, 35 feet long and having no teeth. So the illustration tells you that it has teeth, but it makes us think that it, this could be a basking shark, something that, that, that's that long but isn't thought of as being a carnivore. Whereas the spring, spring well, or springing whale um, can be associated with an orca and apparently it was a um, ferocious flesh eater was how it was described. Um, having seen images of, um, I completely forgotten the word, humpback, humpback whales <laughs> leaping vertically out of the water, it is possible though that this is actually a humpback rather than an orca. But again it's how the animals are depicted from other people's stories and descriptions. Sertilius so used some of these on other maps, like the map of Scotland, from his Terrarum Orbis, Theatrum Orbis Terrarum of the 1570s. And here we have this lovely little whale, um, the only creature that appears on the map, taken from the map of Iceland and indeed from the Cartamarana, this double spouted whale slash fish that appears on many of his maps, um, filling in blank areas of the sea. But on this map, there's an interesting note around Loch Lomond saying that it's tempestuous, it has, it's very stormy, and that it has fish without wings. Just an interesting side note, if you like, buried within the depths of the map. And what's interesting to me about this is that it, this note effectively appears again 120 years later on this map produced by Herman Moll in 1714. And here again, he comments about the frequent tempestuous loch and the fish without fins. It was in his north part of Great Britain called Scotland. And he includes other notes. Here is plenty of cod and ling. And Ailsa, here solen geese are found, gannets. And all round the islands, he talks about the fish stocks. And this is one of the things about looking for um, evidence of animals on maps is that very often it was related directly to man's interaction with the animals, so fishing and hunting in particular. So he's telling fishermen basically that there are good stocks in this area. And then sometimes on maps the evidence is incidental and what we're looking at here is um, one of the little sidelines um, off the map of Scotland of gannets, just drawn as tiny little lines around the Bass Rock. So it's an incidental evidence that it, there was a large sea flock, um, bird flock there at the time. Sometimes on maps, again, the evidence can be hard to find. This is quite a sketchy map, but with lots of text. And in the text, it mentions in the rarities of Keith Ness, an expedition from Lathron Wheel to go out and hunt the silks or the seals, where they enter a cave in the middle of the night and everybody is provided with a baton and they effectively club the seals. So it can be difficult um, when you're searching through map collections to try and find these kind of references. Often catalogue records, the, these kind of details aren't mentioned. So you do have to spend quite a lot of time just working your way through. Sometimes the evidence is 
not on the map itself, but in the cartouche of the map. And this is often an illustrative um, picture around the title. And these were used from kind of the 1600s, maybe through to the mid 1700s, when mapping became more scientific, if you like, to illustrate something about the area that was shown. And here in the top left, we have walruses, the top right, we have a whale hunt. And then the lower right, you can see that Orkney and Shetland are characterised by having fishing, so the fish hanging up to dry. And again, this is reflective of human interaction with the animals. Even on a local scale, so these are from John Hume's maps of um, ascent of various estates and each of them has one of these lovely little hand-drawn cartouches. And we can see the fishermen and um, the little porpoises f floating about near Unapool, the domestic animals and deer at Alderney, and then again another image of fishing with the nets being pulled in at Nochnich at Inverkirkig. And I think that um, these little depictions of the kind of domestic animals that were used are also interesting because it's easy to overlook the kind of farm animals that people would have had. And then lastly, because I'm desperate to stick to time, and um, we can find um, heraldic animals on maps. So Lausanne's already told us about the lovely unicorns, which you can see here on the right hand side. Um, in the middle, we have some deer. And on the left, we have the rather bizarre heraldic antelope with these straight serrated horns and vicious looking teeth. And then at the bottom right again, underneath the unicorns, these mare sheep, I have no idea what they're called, but <laughs> that's what I'm going to, to name them now and with their, their finned tails and sheep-like faces. So animals of all sorts appear on these early maps. And I think it's worth taking the time to go and have a look for them. And they can tell us quite a lot about the oral history and the development of the physical history of the animals' ranges. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. That was amazing. And thank you also for sticking to time. You've set a good um, example for us. Now let's see if I can stick to time as I mess about trying to share my screen again. Um, So you should be seeing my uh, screen, hopefully, on uh, seals. So seals are uh, pinnipeds. They are sent, which essentially translates as uh, thinned feet. Uh, pinnipedia are described as carnivorous aquatic mammals, comprising the seals, sea lions, and walrus. So seals are simply put marine carnivores. The pinnipeds are different from other marine mammals, such as the cetaceans, the whales, the, the dolphins, and the porpoise, in that they do not exist solely in the water, uh, but they come ashore for breeding purposes. They give birth uh, and also just to rest. Uh, there are only two species of seal that occur in Scotland, the grey seal and the common seal. In Scots Gaelic, they're known as the, the ron or the ron mor or ron mara, which means seal or seal of the sea. And the most common Scots word for seal um, is selkie. Uh, the word is now more commonly associated with seals that can shape shift into human form. And curiously, in Scotland at least, uh, it is only the grey seals who have this shape shifting ability. The Inuit of Canada and Greenland have many stories about seals, uh, such as the orphaned boy whose grandmother threw him into the sea and he became a seal pup who then lures some hunters who had mistreated him far away from shore. They're caught in a storm and they're all drowned. In Greenland, Angut is a helpful spirit who looks like a seal and helps the fishermen to catch fish. And in the Pharaohs, there's a story of a young man from the island of uh, Kalsoy who comes across a group of Selkies who are known as the Kopakonan in the Pharaohs uh, on a beach and he instantly falls in love with one of them and steals her seal skin. He marries a Selkie woman and they have children 
but one day she discovers her lost skin and she returns to the sea. Identical stories to this one are told in Scotland and in Ireland as well. And in the Northern Isles um, of Scotland, Orkney and Shetland, they, are, they tell another story uh, in the form of a ballad about a woman who has fallen for a male Selkie, had a baby with him, and the Selkie comes back to take the child away from her. But like so many uh, ballads, it does not have a particularly happy ending. And I'm going to attempt to sing you the ballad now. Bet you weren't expecting a free concert as well. So. Unearthly nourish sits and sings. And I, she sings by Lily Wayne. Little can I, my bairnie's father, far less the land that he stops in. Then ain't a rose at her bed fit, and a grumly guest I'm sure was he. Here am I, thy bairnie's father, although that I be not comely. I am a man upon the land, and I am a silky o' the sea. And when I'm far and far frae land, my dwelling is in Sulmskeri. And it shall come to pass on a summer's day when the sun shines hot on every stain. But I will tack my little young son and teach him for to swim the fame. And you shall marry a proud gunner, and a proud gunner I'm sure he'll be. For the very first shot that e'er he shoots, he'll shoot both my young son and me. I am a man upon the land, and I am a silky o' oh, the sea. And when I'm far and far frae land, my dwelling is in Sulskeri. Thank you very much. No, <laughs> this is the part when the crowd goes wild, right? Okay. So now, next up, we have. Um, I'd like to introduce you to a, a good friend of mine, by the name of Tommy Kusala, uh, of the Institute of Language and Folklore in Uppsala, in Sweden. Uh, we first met in a on a very cold and dark January day. Uh, and I mean cold and dark, it was about minus 40 and 24 hours of darkness <laughs> at a conference in Longyearbyen in Svalbard. And last time I saw him was last year in Germany uh, at the Witchcraft and Animals Conference that we both attended, where he was talking about milk stealing hares. Uh, this morning he was teaching me about ghost pigs in Swedish folklore, and today he's going to be speaking not about ghost pigs or, or hares, but about bears. So over to you, Tommy. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me on this wonderful workshop. And thank you both Paula and Lisanne for your wonderful papers so far. Uh, 
All right. Uh, in 2019, a folk horror movie called Midsommar or Midsummer was released and caused some controversy. The film is set in Horga in Helsingland in Sweden, but filmed in Hungary. Well, never mind the plot of the film. It, it has very little to do with Swedish folklore anyway. However, there is one scene that I ought to mention, and I'm sorry if I spoil anything here. And that is when one person is trapped inside a bear co costume. The person is at this point in the movie at his, at his absolute weakest, unable to defend himself. If you have seen this movie, then you will know what scene I am talking about. I do find this interesting though, as a twist on a uh, mythological role that the bear had in, 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 in the North. I would try to explain how the bear was interpreted symbolically in Northern Scandinavia and to a degree in Finland. In this paper on the bear, you will learn how the animal was linked to both a bear costume and how it was associated with strength and courage, not with weakness nor Im immobility. The bear is native, the bear native to Northern Scandinavia and Finland is the brown bear. It was and still is the most powerful and dangerous animal native here. It is the largest predator and a male can weigh up to 250 kilograms. It can actually be a bit larger. Uh, this is from an old book and I saw just two years ago, I saw a stuffed uh, brown bear that was maybe 20 kilos, uh, kilos bigger or something. Obviously this animal has left some traces and impressions on those who encountered and hunted bears throughout history. The bear is a, a symbol of strength, courage and ferocity. In modern times, it is also a symbol for friendship, kindness, or serves as a symbol for simple minds, someone that is easily fooled. The animal is an omnivorous creature. It eats roots, uh, uh, nuts, honey, berries, uh, birds, egg, veg and vegetation. The bear also hunts for fish and both small and large game. Before human uh, beings settled and became farmers and started building their own homes, bears competed with men for shelter in caves. Another similarity between man and bear comes from when the bear stands on its hind legs uh, like a man, usually when it's threatened and becomes aggressive. There are instances when a brown bear has attacked and killed human beings, but it is not very common. Relations between man and bear in the Nordic countries are old. Most believe that the bear arrived in the north around 10,000 years ago. Among the numerous petroglyphs in Sweden and, and to a degree in Norway, some depict the bear probably as game for human hunters. And most of these petroglyphs are around 3,000 years old and dates back to the Bronze Age. And some of them are even older, as can be or as old as 9,000 years. And if we move on to the Old Norse religion, uh, there is one quite common phenomenon uh, mentioned several times in the sources. It is the ability of some people to change from human to animal shape. The same motif is also mentioned in relation to gods and giants of both sexes. You find animal symbolism in myths, legends, sagas, poems, craft and art, as well as some evidence for the use of animal masks of men in animal guises. For example, bear skins have been found in graves as something on which the dead could be laid, uh, laid uh, on or wrapped around them. And an uh, interesting note is that some uh, Female uh, women have also been uh, buried together with lynx uh, skins. There are also traces of bear claws in some graves from the Wendell Age in Norway and Sweden. That is the period that predates the Viking Age. We can even find some fascinating traces in the onomastic material. For example, the name uh, Bjarnhöfti, meaning bearhead, is attested in runic inscriptions dating back to the Vi Viking Age. For example, around here in Uppsala. Other names appear in old uh, Norse texts recorded in medieval manuscripts, names some such, such as uh, uh, Bjarnhedin, bear, Bearskin, or Bjarngrimmer, Bear Mask. Nevertheless, before we start looking at uh, old Norse material that can be used for arguing that bears were regarded as sacred animals in the old Norse religion, we need to sort out some words and concepts attached to those words. A central concept when it comes to shape-shifting in the north, uh, both in Old Norse religion and also in the younger folklore account is hammer, an old Icelandic word that can be used for an animal skin or for non-human shape, but someone with special uh, powers that is, that is transformed into an animal. 
a man that has supernatural gifts might be called hamramer, meaning shape strong. And, and the verb hamask means falling into an animal rage. Such persons in this state uh, might be called hamtslaus, out, out of his or her shape. A person could also be called a shame leaper, uh, a shape leaper, that is hamleipa, meaning that he or she could, by means of magic, jump out of his or her shape or for someone who had unusual strength or energy. Another word uh, was the plural hamfarir, uh, meaning um, for the ability to send out the spirit, the so-called free soul in, in an animal form, while the body of the practitioner lies as if dead or sleeping. This is associated with, for example, the god Odin in the Old Norse religion, who is said to be able to do this. The, this kind of uh, shape-shifting phenom phenomenon is described in many different ways in the, in the sources. Now, I would say, um, anyone that is a fan of Tolkien and uh, The Hobbit will recognize this motif of sending out the free spirit in animal shape for when the uh, person, when Bjorn joins the Battle of the Five Armies. Tolkien did not invent this. He was inspired by a hero known from uh, an Icelandic saga, which relates how the hero Bedvar Bjarki shifted shape and appeared in his last battle as a bear, while his body was sleeping in the hall of King Hrolf. The episode is mentioned in Hrolf's saga Kraka in chapter 50 to 51, and I will quote a small portion of it. Jörvard and his men saw a great bear advancing in front of King Hrolf's troop and it was always beside the king. It killed more men with its paw than five of the king's champions could. Blows and missiles bounced off it as it used its waif to crush both men and horses in Jörvard's army. And with, with its teeth, it tore everything in reach so that, so that, uh, so that uh, an, an intense fear spread throughout the ranks of King Jörvard's army. End of quote. Bedvar's uh, father in this saga was called Björn, and this, is, this actually means beer. Uh, he was also described as a shapeshifter in a more physical sense of the term. During the night, he was the lover of uh, Bedvar's mother, Bera, which, is, which actually means she beer. But in the morning, he put on a beer skin, uh, a Bjarnarhammer, and went out as a beer. Since there are no bears in Iceland, uh, except the occasional polar bear, uh, and the largest predator is the Arctic fox. It seems probably that the narrative about Bödvar comes from Scandinavia, or more probably uh, came in from Norway. Another story about bears is of interest. It comes from the Icelandic book in account of how Iceland was settled, the Lannama book. Among the settlers were two men who became neighbors in Iceland, but quarreled over grazing rights. It is said that both men were very hamramer, that is shape strong. A man gifted with second sight saw how a great bear came from the direction of one of the men's farms and a bull, bull came from the other man's farm. They met and fought furiously and the bear got the upper hand. In the morning, a hollow could be seen where they had fought and the earth had been turned over. Speaking of fighting, there is another phenomenon that we must uh, mention. Probably the best well-known word for battle frenzy and for certain types of warriors that has ever come out of the north. Yes, I am speaking about the berserker and to go berserk or actually hamask. Let us start with the word itself. Berserker is a compound. The second part is easy. It means a shirt, a shirt of sorts, while the first element is debated. You can meet either a bear or something bare. Uh, although most scholars agree that it ought to denote the animal. Therefore, the word berserker probably means beer shirts. Uh, the most reasonable interpretation of this is that there, these warriors were clad in bear skins. Symbolically, this means that when the bear takes control over the warrior during a, uh, his battle trance, uh, his human side is dis distanced from his violent actions. And this dehumanization uh, results in freedom from human feelings. The warrior is no longer hum human. He becomes a ferocious bear and is inter interpreted as such, uh, as, as such symbolically. 
Similar notions exist of wolves and likely of boars in Germanic religion. Many scholars argue that the bears could have played a specific role in two religious contexts that sometimes could come together. One referring to uh, human bear sexual relations and gene genealogy, uh, and one which is related to the warrior bands or groups called berserki. Oops. There are many reasons for linking the berserker with um, the god Odin. They are mentioned as his elite warriors in the sources and Odin himself is, is uh, perceived as a shapeshifter who sometimes seem to appear as a bear. For example, in, in Saxo Grammaticus, uh, in its famous medieval text, Gesta Danorum, a chronicle of the Danish people, he recounts a narrative about Odin disguised as a charioteer with the name Bruni, that means the brown one, another word for beer, who kills a king. Perhaps Odin uh, actually appears as in, in beer shape in this uh, narrative. Odin has also many names, uh, by names, referring to his bear futures and characteristics. For example, in uh, the word Bjarki, mean, meaning little bear, or Björn, meaning bear, or Rjorter, uh, uh, the word Rjota is used for the sound of the bear. We have it in Swedish as well, like uh, as Rita. Yeah. Other words are Jolfer, meaning horse, wolf, that is bear. And also in the Eddic poem uh, Sigdrifemal, there is also mention of, of runes carved on bear's paws that are related to Odin. I would argue that there is also another god that also fits well with the bear, and that is the god uh, Thor, a god that is frequently described as a lone fighter who both wrestled and uses brute force to defeat his enemies. Actually, there is an interesting episode described by Snorri Sturluson in his introduction to his prose Edda, worth mentioning. He describes a youthful, a young Thor that is proving his enormous strength by lifting 12 bear skins from the ground at once. Some scholars have argued that this might be a glimpse from an older initiation ritual. Actually, in the sagas, there are some instances where the hero has to encounter a bear as proof of his manhood. And this can go from a real bear uh, to one arranged in a certain way as part of a larger ceremony. As bears are, as I said earlier, non-existent on Iceland, the stories probably originated in oral form in Scandinavia. In some of the narratives, the wearing of bear skins and bear clothes are even mentioned. In some of the stories, the company of men, sometimes berserkers as well, is specified as 12 in number. And what is even more fascinating is that the leader is sometimes called Björn, that is bear. Well, the number 12 and the symbolic link to four lifting 12 bear skins is certainly interesting. We might also recall that the hero Beowulf from the Anglo-Saxon poem with his name has also been linked to four. What is even more fascinating is that Beowulf is most likely a name meaning Beowulf, that is bear. We have lingered long enough on animal uh, or bear symbolism in Old Norse religion, although much more could have been said, for example, on the concept of the filgia, a guardian spirit that could appear in the form of a bear, or on the motif of the bear sun. But we need to move on to, to take a leap that would transport us somewhere between 600 to 1000 years forward in time. I have to look at the time here. Okay. I will start this with a brief mention of bears in Sami tradition. We, we know that the bear was a praised animal honored by special names and ceremonies. For example, the scholar uh, Hilda Roderick Ellis Davison says, the word saivo used of slain bear is the same as that used for spirits of men who have died. And at the bear fest, it may be noted that the hunter who had killed the bear put on the head and skin of the dead animal, end of quote. In ancient Finland, the bear was worshipped more than any other animal. In Finland, there are many archaeological findings uh, that tell us about the existence of an ancient bear cult. Uh, this is very well recorded and there are a lot of studies on the Finnish and the Sami bear cult and bear feasts. There was even a custom of drinking the blood of the bear in order to obtain its strength and courage. 
The, la the latter is not only known among the Sami, but has also been recorded for other people in northern Scandinavia. We must also recognize that the people live, that the people live side by side uh, and uh, to a degree under similar conditions for hundreds of years, and they ended up in influencing each other. There are always people who speak several languages and both, uh, and both trade and intermarriage, intermarriage did happen. Among the Swedes living in northern Sweden, there are a lot of folklore associated with the bear. We will look at some motifs that are some, of some interest and that can be traced back to what I said earlier about Old Norse religion. The most uh, dangerous kind of bears in folk tradition were known as slag, björner, or killer bears. Bears that kill cattle and in some cases even human beings. In some cases, these bears were believed to be human beings who had been transformed and appeared in the shape of a bear. That person was a ham, Björn, that is a, ham, a, ham, a hammer bear. Remember what I said about the Old Norse. In the western and northwestern parts of Sweden, the notion of people transforming into animal predators lingered until at least the early 1900s. This notion can, in fact, in fact, as I told you earlier, be traced back to Old Norse traditions. The cause for the transformation was explained differently by different tradition bearers. But a common reason was that the person was cursed or that he or she could do it by their own will, usually with the help of a magical object, typically a belt. The later was more common for animal transformation into a bear. Uh, for the transformation to take place, the person who wanted to become a bear should crawl through the belt three times, usually counterclockwise. And the first time it was said that the head uh, would transform, the second time the half, half of the body, and the third time the rest of the body. When he or she wanted to become a, uh, a person again, he or she should crawl back through the belt again with, with uh, the feet first. In some folk legends and narratives of the North, a hunter discovers something uh, when, he or she, uh, when, when he has shot a bear and is flaying its skin. Under it, he finds something, a belt, a tinderbox, a pipe, a knife sheet, a skin pouch or something. And th then the hunter understands that the bear is actually a, a transformed man. In many folklore accounts, one reason for people transforming into bears is described as a result of the per person's uh, rapacity. One interesting detail and this can also be compared to the berserker, is that a person who transforms into a bear loses all human traits. The person becomes a bloodthirsty predator. This is actually interest, more interesting than it sounds because werewolves, for example, were, st were still believed to have some of their humanity left when transformed, but not, not bears. And, I have, and there are uh, stories in which bears and humans get together variants of the bear sun motif in which a young woman gets lost or separate, separated from her human companions and is found by a, uh, by a bear with whom she ends up living and having children. Eventually the bear is killed and the woman returns with her child who is uh, obviously more stronger than other uh, children and things like that. Uh, and they are extraordinary. This is also a major theme that we won't have time to explore here and now. However, I will mention one thing, that the son of such a union is sometimes said to have the strength of 12 men. This obviously leads us back to the young four lifting 12 beer skins. Time is running out and I need to sum up my talk with some final remarks. The behavior and character of the bear is, have motivated and stimulated human beings. The re relationship between the bear and human is very old and has still, even though wild encounters with bears are not that common, inspired popular cultures and notions of the bear. Many have grown up with tales of bears from time-worn myths and folk tales, songs and ballads, folk legends, to novels, movies, theater, commercials, computer games, as well as artistic interpretations of the bear. Man and bear have walked this earth side by side for thousands of years. The bear has been revered for its strength, been hunted for its meat, bones, and skin, and it has been both feared and shunned. But it has also been a source for comfort and joy. Most kids grow, grow up watching cartoons with fictional bears such as Winnie the Pooh, Paddington, Baloo, or Yogi, while hugging their favorite teddy bear. Sometime, something that is certain is that the 
the bear really is a monumental and towering animal and symbol that even in the future will inspire and capture the imagination of uh, humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tommy. That was brilliant, um, as ever. And um, we're going to stick just very briefly on the bear theme. Um, let me just share my screen again. But this time with the polar bears, where we do see some similarities to exactly what Tommy was just talking about. Um, the Inuit of Canada and Greenland had many, many stories uh, in mythological times that polar bears uh, and people once lived in harmony together, that they were, they lived in equality, that there was no difference really between bears and people. The people could understand the bears and the bears could understand the people. There was even intermarriage between bears and people. Now you can get comfortable in your seats. I'm going to tell you a story, an Inuit legend about a family who moved to a new place and they discovered something unusual about their new neighbours. And like most Greenlandic stories, it has a, a really dark side to it as well. Long ago, there was a husband and wife. They had only one small child. The husband built an igloo for his family near another house that was much bigger. He and his wife did not know anything about their neighbours who lived in the big house. The neighbours looked like regular people. They dressed like regular people. The man and his wife had no idea that their neighbours were really polar bears that had transformed into people. One day, the wife decided to go out for a walk. She carried her small child in a ulipikak on her back. When she came to the big house next door, she thought somebody might be home. So she went in. Inside, she saw many polar bear skins lying on the floor. The skins were completely clean, empty of any flesh. She was very surprised to find that nobody was at home. It is said when polar bears are transformed into people, they leave their fur on the ground. The woman was very surprised to see the polar bear skins on the ground. She was glad that her baby was sleeping soundly on her back. The woman was still inside the big house when the polar bears came home. She was very scared. She had nowhere to escape. The woman with her baby still sleeping soundly on her back hid herself between the lining in the walls of the big house. She listened as the great polar bears, which had been transformed to look exactly like people, spoke in Inuktitut. The polar bears were complaining that they had come home with nothing to eat. Suddenly, one of the polar bears said, I smell a human in here. The woman was very frightened. She did not know what to do. Her child had started making noises and she thought it was just about to cry. She tried to stop the baby from making any sound. She was so frightened that she accidentally smothered her child to death. Finally, when night came, the polar bears fell asleep. The woman did not move. All night long, she stood perfectly still, hidden inside the big house where the great bears lived. She did not try to escape because she was certain that if she moved, she would be found out. The next day, the polar bears prepared to go hunting. At last, she would be able to leave her hiding place. But just when she thought the house was empty, one of the polar bears stomped back into the big house. It seemed the bear had forgotten something. The woman returned to her hiding place where she had stood all night long. As it happened, the forgetful polar bear never left the house all day. The woman spent the whole day and another whole night hiding. In the end, she hid for two full nights inside the big house, hiding from the polar bears that looked like people. At last, the polar bears finally left the big house and the woman returned home to her igloo. She arrived home without her child. The husband was shocked when he learned that they had lost their only child he was also very surprised to learn that they lived next door to great polar bears that looked like people. In the end, the couple moved far away, but for the rest of their days, they lived in fear 
that their neighbors could really be polar bears in disguise. Now, I have no idea what the moral is of that story, except don't go poking around in your neighbor's affairs. Uh, you know, what do we really know about our neighbors? It's a good question. Um, so now it is my great pleasure to introduce you to uh, Karen Durka, who is the Associate Professor in the History of Ideas at the University of Stockholm in Sweden. And today she's going to take us into an exploration of the wolf in Sweden. So welcome, Karen. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to this wonderful event. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about wolves in Sweden and uh, in particular one wolf, because uh, in the local news people, it's, see here if I can there and then local newspaper Dalpilen a small news item was published in January 1886. The caption reads hard winter and the news item consisted of only one sentence. It says a wolf showed itself this Monday at Rolandshov outside Marieberg. And this is today a uh, part of the city of Stockholm. This short announcement is loaded with meaning and contains a world of ideas. And in this talk, I'd like to scrutinize this note to investigate what we can learn from a wolf showing up in Stockholm in the 19th century. My talk will be about challenging sources but also to extract knowledge about a wolf in Stockholm, uh, journalists and readers' ideas about it, and what frightened people in 19th century Sweden, and ultimately how we can listen to wolves. The caption ties to an old vernacular idea about wolves being connected to cold weather and long, dark winter months. A cold and harsh winter affected both humans and animals and prompted desperation in both. According to both vernacular and zoological knowledge, the cold forced wolves to approach humans. It is, one can read the news item, the cold that has driven the wolf to Stockholm. Thereby, the sight of the wolf could be a forerunner for harsh times. The 18th century moralist and natural historian Magnus Aurelius noted how the wolf could be interpreted as a bad omen, a sign of coming evil and bad times. Aurelius' description of the wolf certainly makes sure we understand what kind of animal we are dealing with. He writes about the wolf. Uh, they are large as the strongest dog, covered with ash gray coarse hairs, have a large head with a wide and mostly wide open jaw with white strong teeth, which are ordered like on a saw. For the moralist Aurelius, the wolf represented the border between civilization and wilderness, between human and animal. About the habits of the wolf, he tells us that they are greedy, voracious and attack domestic and wild animals whenever presented with the opportunity. And they hardly even spare humans when they are troubled by hunger and cold, he says. The wolf, according to Aurelius, is a warning about the evil within man, a warning about how humans can degenerate if they aren't careful. He writes, the wolf becomes angrier and more malicious the longer he lives, and he is in this way a living impression of a human who persists to be evil. The wolf thus seems to represent an inhumaneness which is worse than the predators. This is the kind of fear which underpins the mention of the wolf in the newspaper. Cold weather and harsh winter conditions 
transform the wolf into a threat against both human and animal. That the wolf had been seen close to Stockholm suggested it was desperate enough to approach the large city. Such a wolf was worthy of mention even in a local newspaper from another part of Sweden. These vernacular ideas are fascinating. However, I find the wording of the news item that the wolf showed itself even more interesting. The note does not tell that someone saw a wolf, nor that the wolf had been seen. Instead, the wording of the news item makes the wolf the active part. The animal had, according to the newspaper, actively appeared, showed itself, and in this way earned a mention in the newspaper. Behind this small clip, we find not only vernacular ideas about how we can interpret the appearance of wolves, but also the wolf itself, who has done something rendering a mention in the paper. So we need to stop for a moment and reflect over what the wolf could be doing on the outskirts of the city of Stockholm. What do we know about the wolf? In 1886, it was a rare inhabitant in the Swedish forests. During the 18th and 19th centuries, campaigns were launched in order to exterminate wolves in Sweden. The authorities encouraged people <clears throat> to kill wolves with threats of sanctions following failure and rewards for success. Wolf pits, nets, poison, and large-scale hunting were used to get rid of the wolf. The authorities' predator politics grew from a military organization where the wolf was described as an intruder. In 19th century zoological literature, the wolf was depicted as an immigrant, an alien arriving from Norway, Finland, or Russia. In a nationalist construction, the wolf was depicted as un-Swedish, as representing the alien. From this perspective, the wolf's appearance in the small news item can be understood as a warning, warning about foreign powers' intrusion on Swedish territory. The appearance of the wolf can be interpreted as a vague threat and a call to protect the borders of the nation. The hunting methods to exterminate wolves provided varied results. Despite this, the population of wolves by the end of the 19th century had been reduced to a few hundred because of hunting pressure and smaller populations of roe deer, deer and moose, and not the least, the diminishing of wolf friendly habitats. Wolves today often live in family groups with complicated social organizations consisting of individuals related to each other. Of course, I can't take for granted that wolves in 1886 in this example lived the same way as wolves do today. It is in fact very difficult to draw any general conclusions about wolf life because there are great differences between groups and individuals. Still, we do need to take some point of departure and some kind of knowledge about the habit of wolves, considering the wolf itself will not let us know. Wolf family groups have a home territory, and at the age of about two, young wolves leave the territory to find their own family. Wolves move through the landscape with a purpose. They interact uh, with their surroundings and they are highly aware of it. Ecological research shows that predators, just like prey animals, adapt their behavior according to pressure from perceived threats. What threatens large carnivores, and they are fully aware of this, is humans. Studies from the Scandinavian Bear Project show that bears that happen to come close to humans actively avoid them. They seem to quite precisely in time and place 
to be able to determine when and where humans are active and therefore pose a threat. Wolves also choose their location more according to distance from humans than type of landscape. And that means that in the choice <clears throat> between a habitat which is wolf friendly but contains humans and one less adapted for wolves but with less humans, the wolf will ch choose uh, the latter. Not only do large carnivores avoid humans, according to these studies, they seem to understand when they are being hunted and not. That is, they change their behavior according to when the hunting season occurs and to which animals that can be hunted. <clears throat> so a great priority for large carnivores thus seems to be to avoid humans. Humans are the largest threat to them. Also, uh, we can draw the conclusion that the threat humans pose to large carnivores today is no less than in the 19th century. Therefore, I could argue that the wolf in our small news item did in fact not at all show itself as the reporter would have it, rather the wolf was discovered. The wolf as a species had for a long time been exposed to a large hunting pressure. Remaining wolves most likely wanted to keep away from humans as much as possible. The appearance by Roland Sov more likely was a mistake. Perhaps the wolf in the news item was a young wandering wolf. In a scarcely uh, wolf populated landscape, a young wolf will have to search very long for a partner. At the same time, we need to ask a few critical questions. There is a problem with representing the wolf. What gives me the right or even ability uh, to give voice to the wolf in this way? As scholars, to write about others always presents us with ethical dilemmas. As a historian of ideas, I regularly ascribe uh, feelings, intentions, and such to others. I do it with support from an academic and scholarly method, which is supposed to safeguard the ethical position make the statements true or at least likely. Problems occur when the ones I ascribe things to cannot oppose. However, in this, the wolf is no different from, for example, an 18th century shepherdess, or for that matter, the observer who spotted the wolf in Rolamshov in 1886. I need to be especially careful and critical when I dare to read unarticulated intentions into the sources. In the news item example, the active appearance of the wolf can be interpreted as a constructed danger. The wolf in the newspaper was configured as a threat, even though wolves were in fact quite rare in Sweden at the time. Towards the end of the 19th century, notes about, uh, in newspapers about the sighting of wolves became so common in Sweden that they appeared to outnumber the actual wolves in the forest. The word wolf story at the end of the 19th century became a synonym for a exaggeration and made up stories with weak credibility. The news item about the wolf therefore writes itself into a given logic of the press. Perhaps there never was a wolf in Rolandshov. At least in this example, it's not the perspective of the wolf that the newspaper wants to reveal. In fact, throughout Western history, stories that do not venture from an anthropocentric perspective have been very rare. Therefore, I draw the conclusion that the wolf itself is secondary to the author of the news item. To access the perspective of the wolf, I need to consult other research as well as a theoretical perspective. And in this example, uh, ecological research provides information 
for the interpretation. So from this small news item from Dahlpilen in 1886, uh, I have now extracted different frameworks for interpretation. And the results differ according to which context I choose. I can choose to interpret the wolf from the perspective of the newspaper against a background of vernacular ideas and thoughts about 19th century readers in Sweden and what they want to read about. I can read the story about the conditions for wolves in Sweden and how their movements have shaped history. I can understand the note from a more philosophical standpoint and ask what human wolf interactions can tell me about the living conditions for both humans and animals in a larger scale. In these readings of this small newest item from Dahl Pilen, there are thus several possible interpretations to be made. One depart departures from the idea that the wolf showed itself and posed a threat, a warning about its own wickedness, foreign power, or the coming of bad times. Another interpretation sees the wolf as a representation of human evil. The news item in this context warns us about our own wickedness. We should be, be beware of acting inhumanely. It may turn us into wolves. A third interpretation takes its point of departure from the de perspective of the wolf. It lets the wolf itself enrich the story. And according to this perspective, it's the human in this example who poses a threat, not the wolf. This way, it's possible to produce knowledge about the living conditions of wolves in 19th century Sweden and about how people interpreted their appearance. It's possible to bring out knowledge about how large carnivores relate to humans and reflect over what that can mean. It's also possible to say something about the origins of fear in relation to perceived threats in both humans and wolves. And not the least, it's possible to approach a larger truth about how wrong we are to only listen to our own voices. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another brilliant paper. My speakers are killing it this morning. I think it's fair to say this has been great. Um, am I allowed to enjoy it so much? I think so. So for those of you who know me, you know that my main area of research has been on the witch hunts. And uh, my, I've been working for the last, I don't know, three or four years now, maybe longer, on the role of animals in Scottish uh, witch belief. Uh, disappointingly, perhaps, the concept of the familiar, uh, a demon in animal form, a sort of supernatural animal helper, common to English witch belief, is a very rare phenomenon in the Scottish evidence, hardly ever mentioned in the trial evidence, uh, though there are the odd learned references to it, uh, for example, here from William Forbes in 1730. Much more common was that many Scottish witches were alleged uh, therianthropists, that they, they could shapeshift, notably adopting the form of a hare or a cat or a crow. There were benefits to taking animal form, so for witch hares, for example, uh, they were women that had shapeshifted into the form of a hare, usually to steal milk from cows. Uh, we see this very similar, not identical, but very similar traditions in, in the Nordic uh, traditions as well of the milk hare created by the witch for the express purpose of milk theft. Some of the earliest Scottish references uh, to the milk stealing witch hare are found in the Aberdeenshire witch trials in 1597. Uh, one of the suspects, Isabel Robbie, was apparently frequently seen in hare form. The mountain hare, Lepus timidus, a, a native of the Scottish Highlands, uh, but, but, but it's mostly the, um, the brown hare, Lepus europaeus, introduced to Scotland uh, back in the Iron Age, 
that features in witch belief. So it's usually the brown hair. Another common motif is the, the witch in the shape of a hair or sometimes in the shape of a cat has caused some mischief. Somebody injures them while they are in, in their kind of hair or cat form. And then later on, while back in human form, uh, they are, their crime is discovered because they have identical wounds on their human form as, as they did uh, when they were injured in animal form. One of the more detailed descriptions that we have of the witch hair transformation comes from a relatively well-known uh, trial and confession of Isabel Gowdy, executed in 1662, when she said, I shall go until a hair with sorrow and sight and meekle care, which roughly translates into, I shall go into a hair causing sorrow and grief and much trouble. Isabel also claimed she and her coven yoked a plough of puddocks, which is a Scots word for a frog or a toad. And the puddocks did draw the plough as oxen. And I just love that, like what an amazing image that is. Uh, furthermore, she confessed they used a charm to uh, take with us the cow's milk. So they were stealing the milk from the cow, uh, which was done in the devil's name. Theft of milk and hurt to cattle was a regular complaint made against Scottish witches. And this is not surprising given the, the centrality of cattle to so many people's livelihoods. Uh, the sickness and death of a single cow, a potential catastrophe for the family involved. Magical attacks upon cattle and other livestock were thus a direct attack on the household in question. Now, I will leave you now with uh, one of the stranger cases that I've come across. In 1590, uh, Johnnet Grant was arrested for the slaughter of 16 cattle. Uh, she had caused uh, other multiple deaths of humans as well. Uh, but this is where it gets strange. And hopefully there's no children present in the room. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm allowed to say this at this time in the morning. For taking the power of many men's members which is a word for the penis, and taking another man's member away altogether. So in other words, she'd caused um, impotency or infertility. Penis theft is highly unusual in the Scottish evidence. It's not so rare in the German evidence, but here in Scotland, it's not that common. Scottish witches were far more interested, it would seem, in stealing milk than in stealing penises. So I'm not quite sure what that says about Scottish witches, but we can <laughs> maybe talk about that on another occasion. Anyway, enough of that. Um, it is my great pleasure to welcome uh, now Miranda Sishi, who is a PhD candidate um, with us at the University of Glasgow. And indeed her supervisor will be following her as our final uh, speaker. Miranda is doing some exceptionally interesting work on the extinction studies and taxidermy and she's going to speak with us today about the fate of the great auk in particular so welcome miranda thank you so much lizanne uh, it's amazing to be part of such a global zoom and such an amazing panel um, i've really enjoyed all the papers so far it's quite hard to follow on uh, from a story about penis theft but i will do my best the most powerful encounter I have had with a great orc was with its body, or what had been its body. Taxidermy sits in the uncomfortable area between a living thing and a museum specimen, an animal-made object. We might refer to the specimen as an it, or as a she, or a he. Sometimes the animal had a name in life, such as Lonesome George, the last Pinter Island tortoise, who is now on display in the Galapagos Islands, or Guy the Gorilla, once at London Zoo and now in the Natural History Museum. Sometimes the animal is only named after its death. Aberdeen Zoology Museum held a competition to name their stuffed Bengal tiger, who became Rani after a suggestion from a four-year-old received the most votes from museum staff. It perhaps becomes harder for us to think of taxidermy specimens as it when they are named and gendered, even if this naming and even gendering is artificial. Taxidermy's power, after all, lies in its artifice, in its ability to convince us that the animal was once live, and perhaps in some way still is. The thingness of taxidermy, wrote Rachel Poliquin, is in our feeling that the animal is looking back at us. 
I'm interested in how our relationship with taxidermy changes when the animal is extinct. I have stared into the glass eyes of a taxidermy great orc, this one on the slide here, and known that I will never see one alive, and I, I will not see many dead either. The bird sits in a cabinet at Kelvin Grove Museum in Glasgow. There were once millions of great orcs on the planet. Now there are just 78 taxidermy specimens and fewer than 70 eggs from which young great orcs will never hatch. The great orc was a tall flightless seabird. Although it perhaps most resembles a penguin, its closest living relative is the razorbill. Before the 16th century, it bred in huge colonies ranging from Norway over to Newfoundland and was found in the waters and islands around Greenland, Iceland, Scandinavia, Great Britain and Ireland. Bones from the Pleistocene era have been found as far south as southern Italy and the Mediterranean. It weighed over five kilograms and its wings, as you can see here, were short and narrow, held at the side of the body, adapted for swimming rather than flying. Its heavy bill was patterned with grooves and in adulthood it had black feathers on its back and wings, white feathers on its breast, and a distinctive large white spot between the eye and beak. Although they lived by fishing and were fantastic swimmers, great orcs had to come inland to breed. Like many birds that have become extinct in the last few hundred years, the great orc's vulnerability lay in its flightlessness and on its reliance on a few small islands during the breeding season. And like many of those other extinct birds, its key vulnerability was the appeal it held for humans. Humans had always used great orcs as a resource. The first settlers in Iceland ate the bird's meat and they were easy prey for the medieval inhabitants. As well as being eaten, great orcs were skinned for their feathers, which were used to stuff covers, pillows and mattresses, used as fish bait and also burned. Their oily bodies made good fuel. Their largest colony was on Funk Island, once known as the Isle of Birds or Penguin Island, off the coast of Newfoundland. Europeans began making frequent voyages to Newfoundland from the 16th century onwards, drawn by the rich cod fishery. In the 1700s, it was common for crews of men to spend an entire summer on Funk Island for the purpose of killing the birds for their feathers. Some were not even killed. A sailor reported at the time that, if you come for their feathers, you do not give yourself the trouble of killing them, but lay hold of one and pluck the best of the feathers. You then turn the poor penguin adrift with his skin half naked and torn off to perish at his leisure. This excessive hunting meant that when the, within a couple of centuries, the 100,000 great orcs once found on Funk Island had been reduced to nothing. By this point, their breeding range was limited just to a few other islands, the main being Gerfuglaska, and I apologize for my pronunciation there, which translates as Great Orc Rock in Iceland. Gerfuglaska was submerged during a volcanic eruption in 1830, leaving the last of that Great Orc population on Eldi, a small island off the coast of Reykjavik. When the Eldi colony was discovered in 1835, there were around 50 birds, but museums, recognizing the rarity, quickly began taking the birds for their collections. The final pair of great orcs was killed on Eldi in 1844 by three Icelanders working for a collector. They captured and strangled the birds. One of the men claimed to have found their single egg on a rock, picked it up and then put it down again on seeing that it was cracked, although speculation is that he dropped it. In researching for this paper, I came across an article by Tim Burkhead in The New Scientist in 1994 which makes the extraordinary claim that the great orc is the only species whose date of extinction is known precisely. Um, he cites the date as 2nd of June, 1844, the day when the final pair was supposedly killed. First, we do know the exact extinction date for a few animals. Um, the last passenger pigeon, Martha, died in her cage in Cincinnati Zoo at 1 p.m. on 1st of September, 1914, which is about as specific as you can get. Aside from this error, there has also been a great deal of uncertainty around the date that the final great orcs were killed. In his book, Who Killed the Great Orc? Jeremy Gaskell speculates as to whether another trip to LD may have taken place in 1844, which accounts for some discrepancy in the number of eggs that were reported. Two years after the supposed final killing, a curator at York Museum reported being offered a pair of great orcs by an Icelandic fisherman. The IUCN, which publishes the Red List of Threatened Species, 
recognises the last sighting and therefore date of extinction as 1852. So the killing in 1844 might mark the final death, or else it may signify the great auk's functional extinction, in that perhaps only a few non-breeding birds were left. Either way, these last birds disappeared over 150 years ago, at the same time that Darwin was developing his theories of natural selection and evolution. The idea of extinction was relatively new and not fully accepted, disrupting the notion of an omnipotent creator. In 1861, the ornithologist Alfred Newton gave an account of the killing of the last great auks in Iceland, but he was unwilling to explore the implications of a man-made extinction, instead hoping that links could be drawn between the great auks extinction and mass extinction events such as those that had killed the dinosaurs. He tentatively hoped that a few birds might remain alive, but his real wish was that any of these live birds could be captured and housed, naturally, in the gardens of the Zoological Society of London, where they could be, quote, immortalised by artists and writers. Newton placed a huge value on art and literature, reasoning that the alternative to have the skins and eggs only was insubstantial, for, quote, our science demands that we shall transmit to posterity a less perishable inheritance. Newton was unaware of several things. First, scientific advances have meant that the taxidermy mounts and skins we have left of the Great Orc are less perishable now. Temperature and moisture control in storerooms means these once vulnerable specimens can now be preserved for longer. They continue to tell us things about both the Great Orc and its extinction. Last year, a scientific paper examined whether excessive hunting from the 16th century onwards was specifically responsible for the Great Orc's demise, or whether the birds were already at risk from other factors. The paper's conclusion that intensive hunting was responsible was reached by analysing mitochondrial genome sequences from the bones of 41 different great orcs. I'm no scientist and so I don't really know how this works, but I was fascinated on reading the list of the 41 birds whose bones they had used. The youngest specimen had been killed on Eldie in 1844. The oldest had lived and died around 2,850 years ago. What Newton was also unaware of is that the cultural inheritance left by the Great Orc extends back far further than any drawing that could have been made in the mid 19th century. In 1985, the diver Henri Cosquier discovered an underwater cave near Marseille, 37 meters below sea level, which would have once been inhabited. Among the 20,000 year old cave drawings found in what became known as the Cosquier Cave were charcoal sketches of three Great Orcs, two adult males and a female, likely involved in a mating ritual. In a grave dating from 2500 BC on the northwest coast of Newfoundland, a human was found buried with 200 great orc bills that were believed to have formed a ceremonial cape. The great orc clearly had significance to maritime archaic people and early populations, and the power attributed to the bird continued right up until its extinction. Britain's last great orc was killed on a sea stack off St Kilda in 1840. As the story goes, three residents of St Kilda who had never seen the bird before caught it and thought it was a witch. They imprisoned the bird and kept it alive for a few days until a storm arose. Believing that the great orc was causing the storm, they killed it. One of the most complicated things about extinction is that it occurs at different time points. In Britain, the Great Orc became extinct in 1840. It was likely that it was functionally extinct years before that. Its population had become so small that recovery was unlikely. I'll just go back to that original timeline. The date of global extinction has been given as both 1844 and 1852. But of all these time points, none is more complex than when we try to imagine the eternity of extinction itself. The fact that for the rest of this planet's existence, the Great Orc will be absent. Extinction is not only the end of a species, but the severing of an evolutionary thread. We will never know what the Great Orc may have become. But that doesn't mean that the Great Orc story has ended. The scholar Tom Van Doren writes about the importance of communicating the loss of extinct animals, capturing a full notion of who has died and why they mattered. In his words, such stories breathe new life into the dead, enabling them to haunt our lives. And so I return to Kelvin Grove's taxidermy great orc, which continues to haunt me. It's a rare specimen, as I mentioned before, there are only 78 in existence. 
From 1860 onwards, vast prices were paid for taxidermy great auks and their eggs. The great auk is one of the few flightless birds of the Northern Hemisphere, and it's also the only British bird to have gone extinct. Those wanting a complete collection were willing to pay for it. It's tempting to see the Kelvin Grove specimen, like all unnamed taxidermy, as a stand-in for the species as a whole. But this bird was an individual. It's an adult, 62 centimetres tall, and thought to be a male. It was probably collected, and that's the official term as opposed to killed, on Eldie, but its skin was first purchased in Hamburg in 1835. It was sold to a dealer in bird's eggs in Doncaster, and then purchased on behalf of Durham Museum for seven or eight pounds in the late 1830s. That is remarkably cheap, given that in 1890, there were reports of Great Orc taxidermy selling for 400 pounds. This bird was restuffed twice, including by the famous London taxidermist Roland Ward, and eventually sold to a private collector in the 1970s, who loaned it to Glasgow Museum. In 1994, the museum purchased it for £30,000. None of this, of course, tells us exactly how this bird lived, whether it fathered young, how and by whom it was killed. But in understanding that a specimen is not just a reference to a species, but also to a single living bird, by looking into its glass eyes, we get closer to acknowledging the enormity of its life and thus the enormity of extinction. We're fortunate that this great orc is on display. Newcastle's two birds are kept in its storerooms. And this is an issue with extinction taxidermy. Its rarity means it's not always prudent to keep the birds on display, which makes us question, who is taxidermy for? Is it for future generations and technologies to learn more about species and even look to de-extinction? Is it for us? I'd like to think of all of this somehow as being for the great orc itself, the preserved body enabling us to bear witness to its life and death. Alfred Newton wanted the bird to be immortalized by artists while it was still alive. That time has passed. But I'd hope that by continuing to speak about the great orc and by passing on stories of its existence, we can continue to immortalize it. We have 20,000 year old cave drawings of this bird. Perhaps to use Newton's term, the least perishable inheritance would be if the great orc continued to haunt us and if people were still talking about and making artwork on this bird in another 20,000 years. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Miranda. You're doing us proud there. Excellent paper. Um, now I would like to introduce my, uh, my colleague and my friend, uh, David Borthwick, who is Miranda's supervisor as it happens. And uh, uh, David is a lecturer in environmental literature with us and he runs a, a truly splendid program, uh, postgraduate degree called Environment, Culture and Communication, which I, I have the, the joy to uh, teach on with him as well. He'll be our last speaker and he'll be talking about the barnacle goose, perhaps the star of the show to whom this uh, festival, the Wild Goose Festival has been dedicated. So uh, welcome, David. It would help if I unmuted myself. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, that's a good start. Um, so I'm gonna talk about the barnacle goose and why it's a good bird to think along with. I've been fascinated by the barnacle goose for 17 years when I arrived out of the north myself at around the time the geese arrived on the Solway coast. Their charismatic appearance, a yin-yang symbol rendered as a goose, I found to be very pleasing indeed. Their barking calls and movement in groups and families so low over one's head in the avenues of WWT Carlabrick or at Merce Head, or yapping into view on the coastal paths around Rockcliffe seemed something, for want of a better word, exotic. And so did the landscapes that these birds inhabited, so strange to a person used to raised beaches and high cliffs. Instead, I found salt marsh, Merce, to be so fascinatingly alien. As um, one commentator uh, in the uh, mid 20th century, uh, Kenneth Richmond talks of these vast stretches of salting with their glittering pools and their labyrinths of muddy channels made it difficult to know where to begin. Over time though, my interest only got deeper. 
I found the barnacle a bird I could use to think with as something that connected deeply with my research and my teaching. In, well, in shorthand, I suppose the culture of nature is, is, is what I look at. The bird comes with a welter of names and associations, but the one I'd like to begin with is the one uh, local to Dumfries and Galloway, which is the rood goose, so-called because it arrived at the time of the rood mass, the day of the exaltation of the cross, and also the time of a local celebration, the rood fair. Traditionally held on the last Wednesday in September, and so liturgical and seasonal time in twine, aligned with the inward migration of charismatic black and white geese. Here's a connection between a Christian festival, a local secular festival, and the arrival after 2,000 miles of flight out of the Arctic Circle, like a miracle, a population of small geese that mark seasonal time, the tilting of the northern hemisphere away from the sun, the tilt of the whole earth stimulating birds to come back exactly here. Who was it standing somewhere in Svalbard who raised their hand in farewell? Who was it that straightened their back from gardening or feeding cattle along the Solway coast that did the same in welcome? These people are neighbours. And although they may know the birds differently, each knows them in the context of where they are standing, exactly here. There are many names for the barnacle goose, the clack, the clake, the clate, the clacus, the clake, the horror goose, the rothermuck, the rutherock, or rutherock, the tree goose, and in Gaelic, the cathan, the barnacle, or brent goose. And this is before we even get to the folklore. Here's uh, an 11th century codex, the Exeter book, which contains a riddle. It says, of the billows of the beam wood in my black array, white in part were then my pranked garments fair. When the lift unheaved me, me a living creature, wind from wave up blowing, and as wide as far, bore me o'er the bath of seals, say, what is my name? The answer to this is barnacle goose. For it was believed for an inordinate period of time that the barnacle goose was born of barnacles, wet wood storm tossed by the sea, or even from the keels of ships. <coughs> Here is a 17th century depiction of this process, where the leg of the barnacle looks like a goose's neck, while the feeding apparatus superficially resemble proto feathers. Barnacle geese gestate as barnacles. It's usually Welsh Bishop, Bishop Geraldus Cambrensis, who's cited as being the first to write this myth down, but he does so in a very curious way, because he claims to have had first-hand experience of seeing goose, born of barnacles, rise into flight. He says in his trip to Ireland, there are in this place many birds which are called bernicae. Nature produces them against nature in the most extraordinary way. They are produced from fir timber tossed along the sea and are at first like gum. Afterwards, they hang down by their beaks as if they were seaweed attached to the timber and are surrounded by shells in order to grow more freely. Having thus in the process of time been clothed with a strong coat of feathers, they either fall into the water or fly freely into the air. He goes on to say, I have frequently seen with my own eyes more than a thousand of these small birds hanging down by the seashore from one piece of timber, enclosed in their shells and already formed. They do not breed and lay eggs like other birds, nor do they hatch any eggs, nor do they seem to build nests in any corner of the earth. But then he goes on to say, bishops and religious men in some parts of Ireland do not scruple to dine off these birds at the time of fasting because they are not flesh or born of flesh. And that final comment might seem to get us right to the heart of why this myth persists for a very long time, um, long after Cambrensis describes it in text. They're uh, not flesh or born of flesh, and that means they can be eaten during Lent and during fast periods. And so maintaining this astonishing piece of folklore becomes a nice way of dodging religious restrictions on what can be eaten and when. A barnacle goose being born of barnacles upon wet wood 
is closer to a fish than a wire well fowl. And indeed, this uh, dodge, if you like, is, is spotted quite early on when Pope Innocent III has to intervene in 1215 and issues an edict declaring the barnacle goose a fowl on the basis, really, that if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it must be, well, it must be a goose. Um, however, 200 years later, a figure who will later become Pope Pius II visits Scotland. But um, when he does that, um, he uh, is looking at a slightly different myth. Um, he's looking not for uh, goose hatching from barnacles, but for a goose bearing tree. And this is the, the, the first Scottish version of the myth, the others mainly being of Irish origin. He doesn't find the goose bearing tree though, miracles always being just out of reach. But there's a, a twist on this, this goose bearing tree. And indeed what's interesting about it is that in the illuminated manuscript um, of uh, Topographia Hibernae, which is uh, Geraldus Cambrensis's text, his uh, journey through Ireland, what we find uh, by his description in the manuscript is not geese hatching from wet wood, but rather the goose bearing tree. So whoever illuminated the manuscript may have known of the two versions of the story. Moreover, they do seem to know what a Barney looks like, albeit that they rarely look so pleased in real life as these ones do in the manuscript. There are, of course, skeptics of the myth or the belief over hundreds of years, and one of the most notable is Frederick II of Hohenstaufen, who, well, he's at various points King of Sicily, um, Germany, Italy, and the Holy Roman Empire um, from 1220 onwards. Um, but he uh, experiments and, and conducts inquiries um, about this, this legend, as he calls it. We've made prolonged research into the origin and truth of this legend and even sent special envoys to the north with orders to bring back specimens of those mythical timbers. When we examined them, we did observe shell-like formations clinging to the rotten wood, but these bore no resemblance to any avian body. We therefore doubt the truth of this legend. In our opinion, the superstition arose from the fact that barnacle geese breed in such remote latitudes that men, in ignorance of their real nesting place, invented this explanation. Okay, so, but nevertheless, 300 years later, the goose bearing tree appears in Gerard's Herbal um, with uh, the, the illustration here and a description similar to the one that we've already, uh, already received. Um, <clears throat> so, um, it's also worth pointing out, however, that the myth doesn't just encompass what we now call barnacle geese. Um, but also Brent geese, which were sometimes used to be known as, as collared barnacles. Um, and even its Latin name, Branta bernacla, um, Latin, a barnacle. Um, so the, the, the myth, the belief, is likely to have been attached to both barnacle and Brent geese. Anyway, um, while the myth of uh, the, the barnacle, this maritime goose, um, which is not born of flesh, which is uh, spontaneously generated from barnacles, it might be a convenient dodge of religious restrictions, but it also shows the influence of Aristotelian thinking, that living beings might self-generate from inanimate objects. Um, it was thought that wood spontaneously generated barnacles, and why would the barnacles in turn not generate something else? It was only in 1668 that Italian naturalist Rabi, for example, demonstrated that decaying meat does not spontaneously generate maggots thus disproving Aristotelian assumptions of spontaneous generation. But coming back to barnacle geese, um, we might also say it's maybe unsurprising that people were willing to believe the myths of birds being born of barnacles or even of goose trees, since understandings of migration were very hard to come by without extensive travel. Indeed, the great naturalist of Selborne, Gilbert White, was wandering around in the late 18th century still musing on the possibility that swallows hibernated at the bottom of rivers and ponds during the winter. He says, did these small weak birds, some of which were nestlings 12 days ago, 
shift their quarters at this late season of the year to the other side of the northern tropic? Or rather, is it not more probable that the next church, ruin, chalk cliff, steep covert, or perhaps sandbank, lake, or pool, as a more northern naturalist would say, may become their hibernaculum and afford them a ready and obvious retreat? Barnacle geese breeding sites are, in some accounts, they're only discovered in Svalbard in 1907, but other accounts show that Dutch sailors were catching and eating both barnacle and Brent geese in 1597 while on expedition to try and find the Northeast Passage. What I love about the barnacle goose story, though, is that quite simply it's a beautiful story and has attracted so many writers, scholars and scientists to look into its wide currency over such a long period of time. In the early 20th century, Sir Ray Lancaster, uh, he writes on it extensively, arguing for a very wide investment in belief in goose trees and geese generating from barnacles, citing everything from myths in India, uh, which uh, also feature goose bearing trees, to the symbolic motifs found in archeological finds such as these Mycenaean pots. What I find fascinating and beautiful about the story is its refusal to believe that a creature is only one thing. It gestures at metamorphic possibility, at the protean meanings and existences over time of these strange beings we share the world with, and which are so much more than only animal or bird or goose, but which live in their own life worlds, which are so mysterious and beyond our own ways that they can never really be understood, however much effort we channel into describing them or characterizing their behavior. They will always resist such restrictions and be more than we would have them mean. <clears throat> and this is why I find the barnacle goose such a useful companion to think along with. To think of the barnacle goose is to think of the connections between the Arctic Circle and the Solway Coast to think in larger scales than we might otherwise. Migratory birds, you see, allow one to see the world as dynamic, in movement, in constant change. We know from the arrival of these birds that the whole globe is tilting at the moment into either winter or spring. More than this, though, looking at the goose causes me to think in different scales of time and geography. If I love the Solway Coast, and I'm glad of those who are its stewards, then surely I must also give thought to those doing the same in the archipelagos of the Arctic Circle, for there is also here, in terms of my neighbour, the goose's habitat. And those human neighbours in Svalbard and Karlabrik then are also linked, as each place affects the other. In Svalbard this summer, on the 25th of July, a record high temperature of 21.7 degrees was recorded at Long Yearbent. What does climate change mean for my northern neighbours, both goose and human? What does it mean for the polar bears who lack sea ice and must predate upon the eggs of geese? For from bear to goose to human, long year been to Glen Capel, we are connected. The barnacle goose continues to metamorphose, to transform and mean new things. According to one study, some have begun to seek food a little further north than previously, 350 kilometres further northwest of their traditional arrival site at Helgeland, at Vesserval. They're beginning to adapt a little to climate change, avoiding an earlier spring that brings tougher grass and therefore less energy. The Svalbard population continues to thrive after their decline to such low numbers in the mid-20th century, on the other hand, I'm thinking of the north again, and there being only so much north one can extend one's range into in the future. What does climate change mean for my neighbors, goose and human? Another recent study on the Inish Key Islands of Ireland investigated the ingestion of synthetic debris by the Greenland population of barnacle geese who overwinter there, demonstrating, and I quote, frequent and sustained ingestion of microplastics, which are found in their faecal deposits. While amounts were low, the study concluded that the barnacle goose could be, quote, uh, quote, a potential vector of synthetic debris and other contaminants amongst remote areas of Greenland 
Iceland and Ireland if ingested synthetic debris remains within the gastrointestinal tract for an extended period of time. Birds migrate, taking part of one place with them to another, in this case, potentially microplastics. These descendants of the birds Geraldus cambrensis saw a thousand years ago have changed again, and the metamorphic substances we use here and now, plastics, may be ingested and carried north to our neighbours. A barnacle goose helps us to think in scales of time and distance again. A barnacle goose is a useful bird to think with. It continues to change and to generate new meanings, striking a chord with poets such as Roseanne Watt, who has written several poems dedicated to the barnacles of Merce Head, and also the artist Hannah Tuliki, who one of whose projects uses birds to think along with, to consider the coexistence of tradition and innovation, the ever-present interrelationship between bird and human and ecology. And for me, during the long months when they are not present, I think of the north, of the geese. I continue to think along with them in ways that Irish writer Dermot Healy, in his book-length meditation on the barnacle geese of County Westmeath, so vividly documents. All summer long, they attach themselves to the keel of thought and make the long journeys. And sometimes, at night, in bed, the pillow below my head seems a thousand goose miles away. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Um, spot on. And uh, I think we all would like to think along with the geese too, especially this week, um, seeing as this is the festival in their honour. Um, okay, folks, so that, that kind of concludes the, the formal part, if you like, of the presentations. And uh, it just really leaves me now to uh, thank a few people. I'd like to thank um, all of our speakers. I would like to thank the Stove Network, uh, who was instrumental in making the festival happen. Uh, WWT, Kerlaverick who where most of these birds that you've just been hearing about are arriving to right now so if you are in in the area in scotland then i would recommend that you go and check it out i'd like to thank the university of glasgow my institution and the orkney storytelling festival who will be we will be co-sharing some of these events and of course the barnacle geese the twelve thousand or so that will be arriving from the arctic and of course, all of you for coming. Thank you so much for supporting this event. And it's, it's meant a lot to me because I really wasn't sure if this was gonna work because I've never done uh, something like this before. So I uh, really appreciate your support and it has been fantastic to see such an international crowd as well. So this will bring an end to the formal proceedings. I will uh, stop recording in just a, just a moment and then we will open it up two questions for, that you might have for any of our speakers. I've already got a few um, here starting uh, to arrive already. So can, can I just say very quickly, Lizanne, that um, rather than 12,000, it'll be about 44,000 approximately barnacle geese. Oh my goodness, there you go. That's even better. <laughs> 44,000. Where did they all come from? <laughs> I guess they've been uh, breeding. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's even better news. Well, it's a so, bit of a conservation success story because there were very, very few of them just after the Second World War. So uh, go Barneys, go. Absolutely. That is even better news. So thanks for that update. Um, okay, so I shall stop the recording now. <laughs>